Thanks. So, hi, folks. Welcome. I'm here today with Liz Verano, uh, who is just retired, one month of retirement from the city of Burlington after working for 58 years in the city. I don't know if there are many people who can <laughs> just claim that distinction. Um, Liz, tell me a little bit, what was the title that you had within the city of Burlington? My, my last title was uh, Finance and Technology for Fire and Police Department. Yeah. And we first met a few years back. I think I was asking you for some advice around careers and I just was struck, who is this woman who's like <laughs> put together, organized and commands the respect of so many people in the city? And you were working then inside the police department. Right. But tell me a little bit about how you got started. Well, my first job was actually a microfilm technician at the Burlington Police Department. And I was recommended to um, take that position. It was brand new, something that hadn't been done before in Vermont in law enforcement. There was a federal grant, and I jumped to the occasion and learned how to do microfilm, developing all the archi filming all the archives in the police department at the time, and uh, developing the film, putting it in the sleeves, and uh, it was a three-year project. And then- And what year is that? That was 1973. Okay. 1973, that's is why May of 2023 was my 50 years and yep. was special for me. Um, and it was a good, it was a good number. Um, so I did that for three years, and then a position um, at the fire department came on. It was a, a business office position, and I was really, it was an opportunity to just create the office, because it didn't really exist that way, because of the times. It was a lieutenant that um, had the position, and um, he had left, um, or he was asked to leave. <laughs> and, and it was an embezzlement situation, and they were looking for a uh, finance person to come in and, and organize. And I actually didn't get the job because um, I was a woman, and they had never had a woman in the fire department before. Um, and I remember doing the interviews, and it was back in the day when all kinds of questions that were being asked that would not be asked today. And I answered the question, you know, what would your husband think about this? Are you going to oh. have kids? You know, all those yeah. kinds of things, you know. Yeah. And I didn't get the job, and I, I remember being in the interview room right outside of the, the chief's office when the commission was doing the interview at the time. <laughs> That's how they hired. And um, there was all these men, you know, four, five other guys that were there applying for the job, and one of them had gotten the job. And uh, unfortunately, he went out and celebrated. And on Monday morning, he wasn't able to come to work. <laughs> he was in jail. Oh, no. So they celebrated. He yeah. was celebrated a little yeah. too much. So uh, the fire chief called me up. And he goes, uh, are you still interested? Will you come up? And my uh, boss at the police department was like, "Lease, go. Just walk down the street from 82 South Winsky Avenue to 136 and you know, walk in the door. And they needed payroll. And they didn't have payroll. Um, set up, and I didn't know what, how to, how to take care of it. So I, I had to figure it out. You know, just look at what was done before and pay the people, uh, the firefighters. And that was the beginning of the fire department career. And I did that for a solid 25 years, um, and as well as going over then to the police department because I was asked to do that. Yeah. So 19. Department. So that must have been about 1976 that you. 76. Trans I yeah. transitioned. And to who the was fire your department. who was your boss then? Who was Pat Brown? Okay. Pat so Brown was the fire chief. Okay, but who was your boss at the police? Oh, spot Mary Campbell. Mary Campbell. Mary so Campbell. she was supportive of you. Yes, she was very supportive. She she actually hired me. Yeah. Um, she had worked with the high school um, to get some candidates that were business candidates, and I was highly recommended with a friend of mine from the class. And um, uh, she did it for about a year, and then she decided it wasn't for her. And then I helped hire her replacement at the police department to do the grant. So she saw that I, I wanted to get the job done. I want to do a good job and bring new good people yeah. in. And she says, you'd be good at organizing yeah. uh, the fire department business side of things that they, they needed. You know? yeah. It was just a different time. So it's not, not, no reflection on them. It was just the way things were. Sure. Yeah. And so you came out of high school. You went to Burlington High School. I went to Rice. Rice High Rice School. Rice High School in okay. the business program. Okay. Yes. And tell me a little bit about who you were in 1973. Oh, my goodness. And what you grew up in the area, right? Yeah, I grew Colchester? up in Nilets Bay yeah. on, on the lake right outside um, 
uh, Lakeshore Drive. Yep. And I... French-speaking family? Well, very French-speaking. That's where my whole French side of things comes in. Yeah. Um, they were both from Quebec, my parents. They got married uh, and moved to a country they did not speak the language all within a month. Um, had a child uh, the, fir the next year. And my father, um, there's a whole story with my father. I don't need to go into that. But he, he came to this country not having knowing how to speak English. He was hired at General Electric because of his meteorology skills, um, helping fix the Gatlin gun and uh, airplane uh, propellers that were cracking in, uh, in flight. And um, he basically walked in. He says, your oven's too hot and your metal mixture is not correct. I can help you fix that. All in French to this guy he met at the gas station. <laughs> anyway, so he got the job. So I grew up not speaking English, and I, it wasn't until I was in um, second grade that um, I was able to c start communicating well. And because we were only allowed to speak French in the house, and we didn't have neighbors. And it, for the closest neighbors, like half mile away, and there was a French-speaking um, mom there. So she helped tra us transition. And being the second oldest, I'm one of six kids, um, and I had grown up with three brothers and three cousins, the male cousins, so I was around a lot of um, a lot of boys, and just that was normal for me. So I think that's why the the higher at the police department and the higher at the fire department was just a natural. It didn't it didn't phase me that um, I was amongst that um, male population. Yeah, yeah, you knew how to navigate. Yeah, so there are so four of you growing up. I'm going to fix your mic real quick. There okay. you go. There, you're fine. There are four of you growing up in Mallet's Bay at that time. There, there were actually, actually there were, that's right, there were four. And then my uh, youngest sister was born in Burlington. And so now we had three brothers, you know, three girls and three boys. And um, yeah, so I went to, you know, Mount's Bay School. There was no high school. That's why I ended up going to Rice. Um, so in 1973, I had just gotten married. I met my husband at the police department um, or through his father, who was a, uh, uh, corporal there and we had just gotten married and um, you know I was looking to move on with my career I wanted to be a business person and yeah. these opportunities came up cool. um, and what were you doing when you're talking about doing the microfiche that's mm -hmm. 73 to 76 in the police department what ex what were you doing you were, you were oh so we had so Xerox and Kodak came in with the equipment so yep. the camera equipment, and there were upstairs at 82 South Musky Avenue, there were all these files, um, cabinets, and evidence and, and, do and um, reports were all kind of filed together. And what they wanted to do, it filled up a whole room, and th they actually had a pool table there as well, but that's the only way I think it was in that room. And they needed to get the files um, digitized. Yep. And so Kodak and uh, Xerox came in and showed me how to run the equipment, the, the, the photography equipment. And we actually filmed uh, each piece of paper and had to code it and, you know, give it a name, a file name. And then we develop, I developed the film. And then I had a different machine that I had to feed the film into the microfilm yeah. sleeves. And then the sleeves went into a, um, another Rolodex kind of, <laughs> which yeah. is an old word, yeah. but a Rolodex cut piece of equipment for people to retrieve yeah. the documents. So did you recognize something about yourself mm. in doing that mm. work? What did, you, what, what did you recognize as your strengths? You know, I was this eight-year-old kid who brought the neighborhood together. Girl, there were kids in the neighborhood, and I would have a class in the basement of my house. My mm -hmm. father got me a chalkboard. I was eight years old, and I loved organizing <laughs> things, space, projects. I think I've always, so I saw the microphone project as learning something new, really excited about that, um, and ha making a difference, right? It was meaningful work, meaning they had to empty out all that space, you know, in, in the files. Um, and I just love the process. I, I'm, my family calls me the process engineer. Uh -huh. <laughs> they're all electrical engineers. They're all electrical engineers and mechanical engineers in my family. Um, and I, my degree was not in engineering, it was in business. And so uh, I just realized I enjoyed uh, creating things. So when I went to the fire department, um, it was creating an office right from scratch, right? I mean, the file cabinets were not really well organized. You couldn't, f I couldn't find anything. 
And I said, you know what, we're going to start from scratch, and I know how it's supposed to be. I'm just going to do it. And the chief was just thrilled. And within months, he was, you got this. You just tell me what you need. <laughs> yeah. So tell me what you need to do your job. And so you were doing finance and payroll and yep. sort of general systems management. Yep. Yeah, we did billing. What we would call operations. Operations, yeah, business operations, for okay. sure. And um, I was the one that actually would call people uh, for job interviews. Uh, I was sat on the interview boards for the fire department, for the firefighters. I would be the one that did the billing for ambulance, ambulance service. Um, actually, I brought one of the old, um, very original <laughs> onion paper because oh. it was all typewriters back then. It yeah. wasn't, it wasn't uh, computers, yeah. right? Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of the first personal computers in the city, because um, Burlington Electric was well set up and the city of Burlington was, uh, had a mainframe, um, but I had a personal computer because the chief at the time from New York City so we need to get a computer. I was like, I don't know, eight thousand dollars, some ridiculous amount. What year is that? Nineteen. Nineteen. Was it probably nineteen eighty? Yeah. You know, I'd have to have my cheat sheet in front yeah. of me. I don't want to misspeak. And you were do doing DOS. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes. And so anyway, but before that, it was all done on paper. Yeah. And carbon paper. Yeah. So you'd be sending out pills, doing these over and over and over again. It made no sense. So when the opportunity to um, to update how we did what we did came up. I jumped on that as well and created a program with Champlain College later on to do the actual accounting, like an accounts receivable program. Um, I created a budget system that had encumbrances because not everybody was looking at encumbrances back in the early 70s. Um, I mean, of course, they did later, right? And um, I uh, helped buy the city's first you know, uh, system. But I always uh, pride myself in seeing what needed to be done to improve things um, and then helping make a plan to execute the plan and, and make things better. And then you have to refresh. You have to look at it again, um, you know, a few years later and then update it again. Yeah. So that was and, a constant. And how do you feel you were received by mm -hmm. the people around you in doing that? Well, two things. First of all, at the fire department, it was hard because um, they never had a woman in the building and the wives of the firefighters were not happy about having a female working there. Now, now I understand why they didn't hire me to begin with. But I, all, all I was focused on is doing good work, fixing things, making it better, um, and making the organization uh, account accountable because <laughs> that's how it broke. It wasn't as accountable as it needed to be and I wanted to make sure there was a good cross-check system in place. And um, So the firefighters were not all thrilled about the phone call saying, hey, you've been out for two days. This is before, keep in mind, this is before a, a lot not, of rules about what you can and cannot do. We're not reflecting on the right. current department. Yeah. So I would be the one calling up and say, hey, you've been out for two days because I'm doing payroll um, and you're going on your third day. You, you know, are you coming back? What's the plan? Where's your doctor slip? So I was an... Uh, you were uh, HR. I was, H I was HR, but yeah. I was also uh, aggravating people for making those calls. But as some people will tell you, I was also the one calling them and saying, hey, you have an interview. You haven't responded saying that you're going to come and show up for the interview for a firefighter position. Are you still interested? And, and I've had a couple people saying, if it wasn't for your phone call, I, I, I might not be a firefighter today. So, you know, you... You know you did your job when people years and years later will say thank you for those phone calls. Um, we ended up working the contract, the, the fire contract. I was on the negotiation team with the city of Burlington and the fire union. And I always said the, fire un the unions have to be communicating well with the administration in order to get a good contract, so that it works for both. Both was sides. the union already established when you? The union was established yeah. at the fire department and the police department. It wasn't that, you know, it had been relatively newly established in the 60s, in the 60s. Um, but working with the, the union and the firefighters and the chiefs, you know, just knowing what the agency needed and helping make the rules, the regulations, the contract, the policies, um, did a lot of that in the early years. Yeah. Uh, the first maybe 20 years. And, and were then you less considered the management future. or were you part of that union? No, I, there was no union. In, so when I came in, I was the first civilian. Yep. 
I was the first civilian and I was the first female. Yep. And asked me was the union body, Got but it. because I was the only one and I voted to, for myself to not be. And so when I hired, started hiring staff that were civilian, then we had to vote again. Yep. And, at one, and then at that point, uh, the choice to join the Ask Me Union was made. I was never union because I was management. Yeah. From the, from the beginning. From the beginning. So you, I mean, when you're describing that, you're describing a lot of human resources, management tasks, operations, systems. Do you consider yourself in that uh, a leader? I never looked at it as being a leader, but I, I am told that that's exactly what I did. Um, the fire chief from New York, that one that in, uh, got the first computer made possible at the fire department, he had promoted me uh, as operations assistant, which was a title that caused more problems because operations, it's yeah. not, you're not a firefighter, you're not. I even thought about taking the firefighter exam. I was training in the martial arts at the time. I was, you know, I'm, I'm gonna make this. I could, you're gonna I carry can, the I can, body, ca I can carry do the that. body across the line. I can do that, yeah. yes. Yeah. I knew exactly what the test yeah. was because yeah. when we do the firefighter entrance exam, there was a physical uh, fitness component yeah. to it. Yeah. And I, I, I knew what it was, and I was already ready yeah. for it at home, just from other things I mean, I on, as on. an aside, did you ever feel that that physical fitness test was biased towards certain body types or physical you know, types? Because in, in martial arts, you learn how to use your body, yeah. and it's all about your logistics. I was sh I'm short. I'm a short person. So for me, the hardest thing was I was concerned about was the ladder, putting the ladder on the truck. Yeah. Because even on my tippy toes, yeah, I didn't. I would have to toss it. Yeah. I just didn't have the height. Yeah. Um, so I never, never pursued the, that yeah. angle. Yeah. But I was wanted to make a, a point. <laughs> it took a long time, and I think they had to change the exam, right, to have the first. I don't think the exam. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of history there. Um, I was a proponent of. This was I'm anyone talking about the first female firefighter. Yeah. Fighter so. Yeah. But but I was a proponent of not changing anything because it doesn't matter what your gender is, whether you, you just need to do the job. Can you mm -hmm. physically do the job? And if you can't, then you, you should do the job that is needed. Yeah. Pass the test that demonstrates the physical fitness requirements. Yeah. You know? So I was never a proponent of changing it. Uh, that happened years later. Yeah. Um, and early on, we, we had a female uh, firefighter that was hired. Um, you know, and, and again, that there's it's just it's a cultural shift. Yeah. Um, I'm pleased to see um, some women, female leaders in the fire department now, um, and I'm uh, excited for the future. Yeah. <laughs> what that might look yeah. like. But I don't, I don't. I always believe people should be able to do the job. Yeah. Do the the tasks, and um, as as I said, I d didn't feel I was going to be able to do that ladder thing. Yeah. Um, and sure somebody else could accommodate and help. All right, but that's not the point. <laughs> yeah. Well, interesting that, so, you know, interesting to think about the ideas of leadership and leadership qualities, and you've made it through. I mean, these are, again, staff positions, management positions, at, you're serving at the will of either the fire chief or the commission, but you've been through multiple mayoral yeah. um, tenures, multiple police chiefs, multiple yeah. fire chiefs. So talk a little bit about that. What have you seen? Let's just focus on your, your immediate supervision leadership. What, what have the changes been like? Um, I always just did what I felt needed to be done and looked at what needed improvement. Um, and so it didn't matter who the chief was. I felt my job was to establish communication, and the style of communication is based on an individual, not a title. Respect had to be there, uh, obviously, but I always found a way to uh, work with the different uh, leadership styles I was facing um, to make them successful. And that same with the mayors, you know, and, and knowing what was needed in the city. Um, at the time. 
talk, can you just get into that a little bit? When you talk about leadership styles, can you give a little? Well, sometimes people come in. So, you know, I've had a lot of fire chiefs, a lot yeah. of interim fire chiefs. I had a lot of police chiefs and a lot of interim police chiefs. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's a small number of actual people that made the list, right? Um, but everyone comes to the table with their own, I don't know if it's their agenda, but certainly their own mission, what they'd like to accomplish in three to five years. I think it's three to five year terms, yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah. Because that's pretty much what the turnover is. Um, so what do we need now? And um, the person that's hired, because I hired, I help hire with being on the interview boards for several of the fire chiefs. Yeah. Um, and when I did that, I was looking, what do we need now? What type of skill set that we need to bring to the table? Because it changes, right? It could be administrative, it could be operations, it could be just basics, it could be community uh, relations. It could yeah. be, you know, what is it we need? So for me, it was helping them identify the low-hanging fruit to, to make them successful, to make them be bought into the organization because not everybody always agrees right who should it be but for me my job I saw as make it work yeah no matter who it is make it work um, make them successful yeah. and that obviously makes the higher-ups the, the mayor would be successful you know and working with the city attorneys and HR and the budget side of things of course uh, which is a big deal um, yeah. budget's a big part of what so at, yeah, and at some point you move from the fire department and then it becomes a position where you're working for both the fire department yep. and the police department. Talk about that. When did that change happen? Um, well, that was in, in the works for almost eight years before it actually happened. And there were a lot of iterations of how to merge fire and police, you know, fire and police administration, uh, public safety officer, that's just fire and police. and. There, there was years of turmoil about all that. Um, and um, then came a time where they asked me specifically to go over. And probably four years after they had asked me, I wanted to make sure the air was right for the merge of administration to work. And uh, Elena Ennis was hired as was the first female police chief at the Burlington Police Department. And um, she said, Lise, you know, I need you to come in and do That's for the police. That's before Kevin Scully? It was Chief right Scully? after Kevin right Scully. Right after Kevin Scully, okay. Yep, it was right after Kevin Actually, Scully. Yep, okay. Yep, Kevin Scully was there for a long time. And um, she said, I'd like you to come in and do for the police department what you did for the fire department. I said, cool. Those are the words. And I was like, well, I can do that. <laughs> and, and she goes, what do, you, what do you, just like Pat Brown, what do you need? And, and how is this going to work? Yep. And I pretty much established... Um, the parameters, and um, she took me to IACP. Um, actually, I'm wearing that pen. Um, International Chiefs of Police Conference. The very first year I was there in 1990, um, 1999, I should say, and um, that opened up a whole new world for me. And it gave me resources and tools and people to just tap the shoulders on about each little thing that I thought could be improved but one of the things we were trying to do is dispatch you know fire police dispatch and just that was always a, a hard hard area to yeah. address um, so I did a little bit of work with that and there's a list I talk in all day in terms of consolidating in terms yeah. of well the know, consolidating like simply meant well it simply meant um, I would now be responsible for both the fire budget and the police budget uh -huh. Fire technology and police technology, and um, there, there's a lot of situations around all that, and I take too much time to talk about it. But the point was, it was in one person, so yeah. I was the one person. I'm sorry, I keep talking no, it's, to my. No, you're good. Um, and I was comfortable with that because to me, I had the mission, I had the vision, I had a plan for each of these aspects, and I said I needed a team. I brought uh, my um, assistant from the fire department, it was part of the merger plan anyway, although now it's gone back. Okay, so you know, what is old is new again kind of thing, it happens a lot, uh, and it's okay. Um, 
So she came over with me, and then I hired specific people for specific tasks. I hired the very first uh, network administrator. There was no net. A lot of people did a network administration work, but there was always an add-on to their jobs. And I said, yeah. we need someone just focused on this. And, and, and because, again, there was some, some history that needed to yeah. make sure it was never repeated. Yeah. Um, and, and this is making sure your network systems, your infrastructure, infrastructure yeah. works. Yeah. Well. So, well, that actually is part of it. So yeah. the the hub um, grew into a network center. Yeah. And um, I wanted to make sure it was well designed, well protected, well redundant. There are redundancies, um, you know, that we have at One North Avenue that um, yeah. we didn't have before. And people probably think it was always there, <laughs> but it wasn't, and that's why you'd have network down. In collaboration with the state of Vermont, the, yeah. the state of Vermont was leading the um, the uh, CAD RMS records management and dispatch yeah. uh, world, and there was a lot of changes that happened through that. We now have a product that's called Valcor that was developed through Burlington Police Department. Um, Chief Mike Sherling at the time was uh, instrumental. Uh, and then uh, now it's a statewide system, and that collects data and and it's tells what you story. had out, out on your I know front we, desk. We had it on yeah. the the chief was doing the report because right. we record the Burlington Police Commission meetings, and he does reports there using that Valcor system Correct. to tell the story. Yeah, the data. Of, yeah, to tell the story of yeah. response, police response, and yeah. resources. Right. The way that works is that the dispatch center gets the call, goes into yeah. the system. The dispatch is, is assigned to officers. Uh, fire, you know, fire and police have their own right now. Um, but um, then it becomes an incident, and then what you see here on your screen was yep. the incident data. Yeah. I think we forget, and I think you know, one of the things that I just think is so amazing about you, Lise, is that you can help tell the story of how these systems really. There's policy. There's mm -hmm. like. There's right. leadership that makes policy on this level, and then there's the systems. Yes. And then there's really the people, the yeah, operations. And, that yeah. decide how, mm. you know, when you put a street in, it decides yeah. how people are going to move down that street. If you put a sidewalk, right. are people going to be safe or not? So just like, you know, I'm just, how have you come to embody that from that eight-year-old who's teaching <laughs> classes? What um, have you learned along the way? So on the fire department side, the, f the first CAT RMS system was, well, I shouldn't say CAT RMS, it was a, it was a um, records management system, it was reporting to the state with reports to the federal government. I was one of the people that helped design the very first DOS base, <laughs> D-base uh, system, again, with Champlain College, uh, who offered some s support services. And, and then it, your, it got... In, in your, your impetus then was to report on what you needed to report to the federal we, government or the state. Better, okay. be better, more efficiently. Okay. So bringing yeah. efficiencies to manual systems. Yeah. I just said that. So probably that's what I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then to take, to make sure that um, the data was easy enough for people to put in, to make it accurate. You know, everything goes through um, learning curves. Yeah. Even today, the brand new systems, people have to learn the new system. Got to make sure it's not, you know, garbage in, garbage out is yeah. not not a yeah. good thing. Um, so I did that. So I, I came to the police department with that, having done that way back. And so when the idea of the, the canned systems that were available were not doing what we needed to do for reporting, for operations, for the chiefs, for the uh, battalion chiefs, or, or the deputy chiefs, for that matter, at the, at the police department. Uh, we needed to, we, that's how Valcor came to be, is that we just need to design our own. You, you created your own system. Right, because Burlington was, was uh, pretty diverse with its population, with its schools, with, it's, it's like a big city and a tiny little place. And uh, we needed to do more at that time than what maybe a lot of the smaller communities yeah. needed to do, that they could use a system yeah. that wasn't as elaborate. And so we keep, even today, we are still trying to improve the yeah. systems. And how do you learn about those those pressures? Where do you learn about those pressures mm. how do I for see improving them? those systems? I, I hear people. Yeah. I hear people who will complain about how cumbersome something is, how time consuming something is, or, or um, if I, I, I listen, I guess. I yeah. listen to, to yeah. what people are saying and watch what they're doing. 
um, or questions that are being asked that can't be answered easily. I'm like, there's an answer for that. We yeah. just we just got to figure out how to get the data, get the information, and yeah. build a system if we have to. Yeah. So let's just um, take a couple of minutes to talk about your your tenure through the city for the last 50 years through multiple mayoral um, tenures. And is there anybody that stands out to you mm. or anybody that you had, um, that yeah, anybody that you want to remark on? Well, I think there's some interesting fun stories. Um, I'll, I'll never forget uh, when Bernie Sanders was mayor and I was um, at the fire department and I was wanting to do an ambulance fee increase. And, I, and the mayor and the city council needed to approve those things. And I remember going up into his office, and he, saw, he was such a casual person. Yeah, keep talking. Okay. He was such a casual person, um, different from what we had had before. And so out of respect for him and trying to help him be successful. As, he didn't wear in, a suit and tie. Oh, That's no. That's what you mean, yeah. Oh, no, he did not wear a suit and tie. And, and yeah. Bernie, I hope if you see this, you'll forgive me. Yeah. I remember walking into his office. And he had his feet on the table, on his desk, crisscrossed. He had holes in his sneakers. His socks were pulled up. His hair was the way it, it is. <laughs> and I'm sitting here talking to him. And I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be me. I'm, I'm more formal that way, right? I'm just being respectful. And I'm, am I, am I getting through? And he goes, Yeah, whatever you think. Wait. Well, yeah, no, but Mr. Mayor, this is important that you understand this means an increase to the, ta to the citizens when they get a, uh, a transport by ambulance. Yeah. And I want, you're gonna, they're going to call you and complain that their fee went up. I want to make sure you're okay. No, I understand. You, you know, and he was very clear, but very relaxed about the whole thing. And basically, I think what it came down to is, is well, you've been doing this a long time. I, I'm, sh I'm sure this is going to be fine. I said, okay. So then I went to the treasurer and, and let the treasurer know as well what was happening and of course the chief was already way behind me he was it was he hadn't thought about increasing rate increase but i'm looking at the budget and i'm looking at it hadn't been done for like 10 years and yeah. it's time yeah so um so that was an experience that i'll never forget yeah and, <laughs> and what then, did you learn i mean what, what did i what learn did it tell you about i think him i learned a... that people are going to are themselves and they have different styles. Uh -huh. it, it doesn't take away from the role that they play, the responsibility they have, and my job is to help the community at large, yes. right? At the end of the day, it was the help. community at large that I was trying to help. Oh. Just because I raised the in, uh, ambulance rate, it had because I wanted to keep the ambulance in service. Yeah. I wanted to make sure it was operational and yeah. supplies and everything yeah. else, you know, everything was going up. Um, the other mayor that really and I'm, and this is kudos to Moreau actually, because he, when he came in as mayor, he was the first mayor that came to the fire station, and asked questions of the command staff, and it was oh. myself and the chief, and he was probing questions, wanting to understand. After he'd been elected already. Yes, yeah. after he had been elected, and, but it was, it was not common for a mayor to come walking in, and saying, I want a meeting in your office, ask those questions. So I give him a lot of credit for researching and listening at, you know, to what, what we thought. Um, that had never happened before. And so over the years, um, you know, when there was a big change about to happen, it was, it was comfortable enough for me to talk um, about those things and what it meant. Here's the pros, here's the cons. You make the decision. And that's just not the mayor, it's the chiefs, the deputy chiefs, whoever was in charge of taking action. My, I saw my job as informing them, giving them the information of, if you do this, this can happen. These are the choices. This is the risk assessment. You know, this is the potential downfall. Um, at the end of the day, it's your decision. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, with those, those big leadership changes, in 50 years, you must have seen things that propelled change mm. either for the good or the bad are there are there moments in time that you felt like we were getting things done in a good way or or getting or you know there's been falling back yeah there have been several of those i mean that's life right and those five year cycles i tell you about i mean a marriage is like that too sometimes you know you've got the really good years you got oh that's not good and then you got a year you're really in sync oh that's a smooth that's nice oh. well a community is the same way <laughs> Um, I think 
I think the hardest one for me, and I'm, I'm afraid this is sort of political now and I don't tend to do the politics side of things, but it was really hard when the defund the police happened. Uh -huh. I didn't understand it. I didn't, I didn't, I wish I could have had more conversations with the people who felt so strongly about wanting to do that. Um, but it's almost like there was other forces at work. And I remember telling the, the police officers in, in a meeting, in a, in a, roll, in a roll call and um, the chief's meeting, saying, oh, this, is, this is a phase. We've been through really tough times before and we've come out of it, we'll be okay. And um, a year went by and I'm like, man, this is not getting better, this is getting worse. Um, so that was scary, that was, that was really hard to, to be wrong, to be wrong about my rose-colored glasses being solid and that things would get better. It took a long time. I think we, I think there's some shifts happening now um, that put us on a better path. But when something breaks down, it's like a bad habit. You know, you, it's easy to start a bad habit. It uh -huh. takes twice as long to undo a bad habit, right? Whether it's smoking, whatever it is. Uh -huh. And people don't realize how fragile a good system is if, if, you, if you bring it you bring it, break it down so much that it's got to really start over. Yeah. So um, you felt like the, you felt like the folks that were calling to defund the police, and then the decision of the city council was the the negative impetus. Yeah. And was there anything that was learned during that time as well? During the. I, I I'm not. I think people are still learning. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't think it's. I don't think it's fully recognized people are starting to recognize people who felt strongly about why they wanted to defund what was sad about that is by doing that they took away the very programs that they wanted uh -huh. they said they then said they wanted uh -huh. and needed uh -huh. and now the program was was decimated and there weren't people to do the work so that's sad that's very uh, unfortunate uh -huh. um, and then rebuilding it in a different way um, is what's possible now. And I always look at what is possible. What's the future? You know, the possibilities are out there. Um, we really have to work together, talk, understand, not just talk, but understand where are you coming from? Why? What is exactly, you know, if we could have gotten really good answers about that as opposed to pointing to the rest of the world, the rest of the country, because Burlington wasn't that. Uh -huh. um, and yet, it was in people's minds, yeah. and therefore fighting that, 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 fighting that. Yeah. And this is that. This is the place between the sort of the political leadership, where mm -hmm. policy happens, the operational and management mm. who understands, and then the people who are doing the work. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, where's the place that those all come together? Mm. You know, in in yeah. certain ways, it's in a person like you in that job. But how do you? Make that institutional. Well, well, they're like life lessons, right? Uh -huh. um, the people doing the work do not forget. Everybody that does anything is a part of the solution. And they typically are doing their job 100% every single day. Doesn't mean somebody doesn't make a mistake, doesn't mean, some, you know, some stuff happens but they're doing the work the, and the management is just trying to organize people and give them direction um, when when the two don't when the two don't come together in a clear way that's when you have this lack of uh -huh. uh, lack of focus and yeah. direction so it would be best if and i believe there is a future where everybody is communicating well and clearly yeah about the mission and, and break it down into pieces. Go with the low hanging fruit, it always works. You go with the low hanging fruit because it establishes relationship and possibilities and all of a sudden you're talking to someone you didn't think you had anything in common with, but you do. And, and I do this on my personal volunteer work. Every single time you bring pe the right people together, there's a conversation that's going to happen and people may see something in someone that they didn't see before. But you have to have your eyes wide open and if you're only focused on an agenda because of the sake of the agenda, then 
I actually don't have a lot of time for you. <laughs> just because that's just not going to be helpful. Yeah. Um, I want to be mindful that I want to talk about your volunteer work, mm -hmm. which is, you know, first of all, you were the president of the Burlington Rotary. Mm -hmm. and the Burlington Rotary just celebrated its 100th anniversary. Yes. Um, and I imagine you're still involved in yes. Rotary. And then you're also the honorary consul to um, France yep. Yep. Um, as part of the Burlington Sister City. Right. Well, in relationship a derivative, to a derivative. the derivative, yeah, <laughs> from your work as part of Burlington Sister City with Henri France. So can you just talk about that a little bit, your Rotary work, your volunteer work, and your council, you know, is it? Sure. Um, let, let me start at the beginning. Let me start yeah. at the beginning. Four yeah. minutes. Four minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. yeah go All right. Ahead. So, uh, so in in Burlington, in the city of Burlington, with my work, um, I was actually asked to translate for a Russian fire chief that was coming to Vermont to Burlington. He was going to go to the 911 center in Montreal, and I was the one that spoke French. And the mayor had asked me then if I would be his, uh, and the chief asked the fire chief, and the fire chief asked me if I would be his translator for a week. And so I did, and I, we took him to, to Montreal. Well, that became the, you know, the girl that speaks French, the person that speaks French in, in the city. And then um, uh, a group, uh, Bob Kiss term, had gone to, um, well, there's there several pieces there, but people have taken, making a trip to Enfleur, France, and Enfleur, France is where Samuel Champlain came from, mm -hmm. and so they said, we should have a sister city, it's a port city, it's on, you know, Burlington's on the port, so we created the Burlington sister city in uh, uh, 2012. I, I was asked to go to a meeting, and by several people, and then I was nominated to president of the Enfleur sister city, and I said, what am I supposed to do, what does this mean? She goes, oh no, you'll figure it out, and we'll do it, and that's what we did. Um, so I was the president of the Enfleur Sister City, and we've been doing a lot of good work. It take me too much time to talk about all that, although I'll come back to you later and tell you about what's going on okay. next, okay, yep. another time. Um, and then um, in 2017, I was, uh, I, was made I was knighted by the French government uh, in France. The president of France knighted me. Um, I'm not quite sure who put me in for that, but um, thank you. <laughs> And, um, and a couple of years later, uh, Ernie Pramelo had been um, honorary consul to France for 17 years. And I had been partnering with him since 2012. And he said, Lise, you know, you're next. <laughs> you, you, yeah. you got this. I said, oh, I don't know if I could do it. So we'll partner. You know, he took care of the fun part, and I took care of organizing things. Um, so I was made honorary consul. And, um, and that's where I am today as far as my volunteer work. Um, I was with Alliance Francaise for many, many years. I still am. I'm a lifetime member now. Thank you, Alliance Francaise. Um, and I was on the board, uh, bringing French culture to Burlington, to Vermont. Mm -hmm. And I do that now. I have, I've recognized some World War II veterans in Montpelier with the governor. Uh, last year, it was a really nice proclamation um, in Montpelier with the fl international flag raising. I've done that for many, many years. The thank you to the Burlington Fire Department, Police Department for the color guards that did the best presentation in, in New England because we actually raised a flag. We had the honor guard and uh, the consuls in France and Quebec, Canada. Um, just loved doing it in Burlington because we had such a good presentation. Um, so all those things. Uh, come together. Again, there's a team behind every single one of these things I'm talking about. These yeah. Enfleur Sister Cities, amazing group of people. Um, the Alliance Francaise is actively working to get on the marketplace. To, if we could only get some place to keep our cart. Uh -huh. um, but uh, a lot of good work, a lot of future yeah. projects. M Rotary, and in fact, is working with um, Burlington Rotary and Enfleur Rotary are working together to do a, a sailing for Crohn's disease awareness, oh. uh, like they did with polio, yeah. the eradication of polio okay. with Rotary, like to do that with Crohn's disease. It's a disease nobody wants to talk about because yeah. it's very personal. Um, and so there's a young sailor sailing from Enfleur to Quebec to the United States, stumbling to Burlington on June 16th. Cool. And uh, we will be at the community sailing center. Um, and he'll talk about his life story of living with Crohn's disease. Um, so, and then, yes, we did the 100th anniversary of uh, Rotary. I had been the, I 
signed up to do the archives. Again, archives are in my, in my yeah, history, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's the Lumiere project with 180 um, uh, Flynn Avenue, uh, trying to get uh, France in um, to recognize the Burlington Lumiere North American factory right here, right here yeah, in Burlington. Right here, yeah. So there's a Where lot the of good stuff Beer happening. Company is yeah, now. Burlington yeah. Beer Company, yeah. right. Yeah, great. Right, right. Well, that is, um, you know, I did have the honor of getting to attend your retirement celebration at Copper. And I have a couple of videos here that we're going to play at the end of this okay. um, conversation. We'll, we'll, we'll append them. The mayor read a proclamation making Lise Verano Day. Lise um, E. Verano. Lise E. Verano <laughs> I love my Day. middle initial. <laughs> That's right. And we have um, a, a statement from Ernie Palmerlow yes. to you as well that we'll share. Um, I just, thanks for sharing some of this, you know, I feel like we've just scratched the surface of who you are, Elise, but I really appreciate you taking time uh -huh. to share your story with us. Well, thank you for giving me an opportunity to reflect a little bit. I'm glad you were asking all the questions because I wasn't sure what we we're going to talk about. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah this and nice. you have um, time now to spend with your family. Yes, I have. I have a son and a daughter. Um, one, my son's in Colorado. My daughter's here in uh, Williston. With two grandkids here and two grandkids, and so uh, definitely looking to make more time with them. Uh, my husband, um, who probably has sacrificed the most, because I, you know, I just I now have eight hours a day that is for me. Um, I'm trying to not probably, fill it. You were probably working <laughs> more than eight hours a day. I know, guess, I know. Yeah. Well, the eight hours comes from the eight hours a day or yeah, yeah. more. Sixty yeah. hours a week I was putting in at the police department for yeah. my work, my paid job. Um, and so now I have a little bit more time to just just slow slow down or relax a little more about um, how much I want to do. Um, but I'm always going to be looking to what I can do to network people, connect people with projects and opportunities. I and mean, that's what I love to do is to watch people evolve yeah. just because you put them in touch with each other. And, you know, I can see, oh, wait, if you talk to so-and-so, that will take, that will roll. Come yeah. back, let me know how you're doing. I'll, I'll give you another. Yeah. I love doing that. I don't think I can stop. Oh, <laughs> great. Well, thanks. Thank you. Please, Verano, uh, thank you for joining us. And if you've enjoyed this conversation or you'd like to watch other programming on Town Meeting TV, you can stay tuned to the cable channel that you're watching on or you can find us at www.cctv.org. Uh, take care. Attorneys, HR directors, police chiefs, and fire chiefs to make improvements to city systems and operations. And it is great to look out and see so many friends uh, of the city from past administrations, past, past leaders in those roles are here with us tonight. Thank you. Um, whereas in the early years of her time with the city, Lees led men first in the Burlington Fire Department. Not only herself as the first female employee, she created the first purchase order and encumbrance system. She secured the first computer, and she purchased the first fire EMS system. Fire EMS. <laughs> it, is, it is quite remarkable the span of, uh, of operations that Lise has presided over. Um, whereas Lise was instrumental to the police department's consistent success in ensuring balanced budgets and conceived and guided projects such as the vehicle replacement plan, the portable radio replacement plan, and put her stamp on the development of Burlington's public safety communication infrastructure. And whereas these oversaw the merging of the fire department and police department business operations and organized new business systems for the fire department, sorry, for the police department, which have included building a bridge between BPD and the state of Vermont, Department of Public Safety to work collaboratively through technology, supporting public safety communications, infrastructure, and supporting public safety IT. And whereas these contributions to the city have extended far beyond the workplace, as she has devoted her free time to advance initiatives that promote collaboration and strengthen community. And whereas Lee's has led the own floor sister city relationship, the city of Burlington, promoting our city's relationship with France, Firmering bonds of friendship and respect between our cities and supporting initiatives to benefit French and American communities alike, for which she was awarded by the President of France 
through the Consul General of France in Boston, the rank of Chevalier, for her years of work on various French initiatives in Vermont and internationally. Really quite a remarkable station. And whereas Lise has been a dedicated member of the Burlington Rotary Club, including serving as president, I see so many Rotary Club members who us tonight, thank you. Now, therefore, I, Merle Weber, the mayor of the city of Burlington, do hereby proclaim October 20th, 2023, the Lise E. Barrow Day in the city of Burlington. <laughs> So sorry I cannot be there today, but I wanted to put in a few words to celebrate your 50 years, which means you would have had to start when you were three, I believe. But anyway, I just wanted to celebrate with you and all the people that are there and to thank you so much for all of your support. Um, you know, working with the Consul General in Boston and working with Alliance Francaise and creating the sister city connection and all the things that you do for, you know, the French community, the city, the fire, the police. Um, you've been a right hand person for me for years, working from the time we uh, did the quad centennial. Um, and my position as honorary consul of France to Vermont, and then turning the keys over to you. So um, now I'm your right hand person. So. Anyway, you've done so much for the city, you've done so much for me personally, for the French community, for the sister city relationship, um, and all the things that, you're the detail person, I was the fun person, we made a great team, and we will continue to support each other. So I just wanted to say congratulations. A uh, few people have that length of time and this legacy. So congratulations and all my best. Um, I, have, I, I carry this book around with me, um, and the very first correspondence from the Burlington Fire Department was firefighter applicant Michael Lachance from Lise E. Barano. Uh, congratulations, you have passed the first two phases of the recruit testing process. Wow. <laughs> um, but, you know, entry level candidate, congratulations, you have passed all phases. Please verify. <laughs> Data fire. Congratulations. You have passion for the physical. Please confirm your writing by June 2nd. You start June 7th. Please <laughs> verify. And I'm like, man, who is this? Please verify. <laughs> and when I joined the fire department almost 25 years ago, um, Lisa was there. Her office was in the back where our training room is now. And she was there for everything. She was. She was probably, between Lisa and Nancy, the first two people that I saw walking in the door. Um, and I knew instantly I was in good hands. So when I promoted to the fire chief's position just this past March, one of the first people to reach out to me was Lisa. And she just wanted to make sure that I was squared away. If I had any questions, please reach out. And I did. And we sat down. And I just always appreciated Lisa for her knowledge and for her history with the city. We had a bagels and coffee recently and she she entrusted me with some very important fire department artifacts, um, old city reports, um, rules and regs manuals, handwritten by past fire chiefs, like really cool stuff that she entrusted me with. And I and that, that didn't that the magnitude of that is not lost on me. So from everybody at the Brooklyn Fire Department, I want to thank you for your leadership over the years. And I'd like to present you with a, actually wicked heavy, black. <laughs> so thank you for Lisa Barrow, with great honor and, and recognition and dedication, dedicated service to the Brooklyn Fire Department.